yesterday, hopefully, you got a good idea, a good concept of the whole single farm approach, the whole terroir concept of why single farms grown in single and single batches is important to us. But in regards to flavour, provenance of barley, and the whole journey that we bring the barley from field into the distillery, and how important it is for us. All right. So hopefully, that that tour yesterday gave you an understanding of that. So what we done here, so in Ireland, we've sourced barley from not just the southeast of Ireland, but we've gone up as far as Donegal to source our barley. We've gone over as far as Galway and down to Cork. Right outside the gates of Middleton, we have our farms that have supplied water for distillery, all right? Um, all in the drive to find different terroirs, different flavors from barley grown in different areas. Within those single farms, we also look at different farming techniques, organic, organic farms. We visit Paddy Tobin, one of our 15 organic growers. We have biodynamic growers. We met Trevor Harris yesterday. He's one of five biodynamic growers we have. And then you have all the single farm conventional growers. And we also have heritage barley that's grown by one of our growers as well, all right? All of these barleys are grown under different soil types. So we do a lot of study and research into the different soil and the microclimates in each of the areas. So we understand how that impacts the flavor of barley grown at source in a particular farm. So, as we speak, the farmers are preparing the land, they're getting seed into the ground in the hope that we'll have a successful harvest come this August, all right? So he, we spoke to the farmers yesterday, both the organic and biodynamic farmers have still yet to put seed in the ground. Looking at the weather today and the forecast for tomorrow, the next day, it's probably gonna be another two weeks. That's not good, all right? They're gonna struggle, I think, to get um, low proteins first. They're gonna struggle to get a good yield based on the way the weather is at the moment, all right? Some of our conventional farmers have seed in the ground since February. There was good weather in February, and I think 80% of them got seed in the ground. The 20% who decided to wait are caught, and they still haven't got seed in the ground. Who knows what it is for them? They probably won't have um, quality barley for, for uh, malting, for brewing or distilling. It'll probably be sold at this rate as feed barley. So they're the complications the farmers have. They're totally dependent on weather, all right? So 20% of them are in a gray area of how they're gonna um, see the next few months, all right? So typically we harvest at August, August time, and we were at the Barley Cathedral yesterday, so the barley will start to go into, into the Barley Cathedral and stored in all these individual bays. It stays there for a period of time, and as we speak, we have a biodynamic batch from last year's crop in the distillery, which we're pr processing at the moment. So when we go up to the brew house, we'll see um, the sixth brew of the first biodynamic going through the system, all right? And we also start distilling biodynamic yesterday, all right? So you, we'll get to taste some spirit. Actually, will you see when we'll be on hearts? Uh, will you? Just see when we'll be on hearts, Ian. We got did, did you taste a new one? So Ned had samples, did he? Did you get them from the control room or? From the lab. Oh, Colin, brilliant, brilliant. So what I do then is I call the batches about a month before I use them. So I call them from the Barley Cathedral that goes to the maltings, which is in a tie. So our malt house is centrally located here between Dublin and Waterford. It's centrally located because the southeast of Ireland is where the hub of barley growing is. So the maltings is right in the middle of them. We use a company called Bort Malt. In Ireland, they're called, they, they operate under the umbrella Minch Malt. They're owned by a company called Bort Malt, which is a worldwide company. And that company is owned by Axrail, who are a global company as well. They have maltings all over the world. And they happen to own the one we use in Ireland. Minch Malt supply Irish distillers. They display Diageo, they supply ourselves, and they supply most of the craft um, uh, breweries and distilleries in Ireland. Luckily for us, we have our own designated small maltings beside our main maltings. So that's solely for our uh, purpose, which is ideal for the single farm additions, all right? So the malting process, so 100 ton of here, so if we called up Biodynamic two weeks ago, four lorry loads, collected barley from the cathedral and brought it up to the Maltings, which is about 40 kilometers north of where we were yesterday. It goes through this malting process, which is steeping, germination, and kilning. So three steps takes about four days. 
We request our molester not to use gibberellic acid to promote enzyme activity, very similar to the way the Scots request that as well. So steeping reintroduces moisture. I explained yesterday that we have to take the moisture out of the barley to store it. Now what you're doing is you're reintroducing the barley to water. So water, you're increasing the moisture of the barley now. So it's basically what's ha happening is you're introducing the barley that you saw yesterday to the conditions it would grow in the, in the field. Wet moisture. So you need moisture to start growing the grain. So germination is growing the rootlets. You're developing the enzymes you need for brewing, all right? So what happens here is rootlets start to grow, enzymes start to develop. And after a period of a, a day or two of germination, then you need to lock in those that germ the enzymes you need for brewing, all right? So what you do, it goes through the kilning step. So you remove the moisture, you dry the grain, the, the roots that are after developing are, are destroyed, and you lock in those um, enzymes you need. If you're doing a peated whiskey, this is the step where you get your smoke. So you would put your turf fire outside the kiln and you blow smoke up through the grain. And that's where you get your smoky um, whiskies from at this stage. Now, in Ireland, there is nowhere that has the capability of smoking um, grain. So if you see a peated whiskey that says it's Irish and that the grain was peated in Ireland, it more than likely was peated in Scotland. So I can tell you that our peated whiskey that we have, our grain is Irish, so we source the grain in Ireland. We also source the turf in Ireland, but we send it to Scotland for the peating process, and then we bring it back. All right, so our partners in Atai have a maltings in Scotland that has the capability of peating the barley. So we send it over there, and then we bring it back. All right, costs a lot of money to do it, but it's as Irish as we can get it, and it's done by professional maltsters who understand how to peat malt correctly. All right. So then the single farm batch comes to the distillery here. So the brewing equipment you'll see today is what was here, what was, what was handed over to us from the old Diageo brewery. It works perfect for single malt um, production. So we have a hydro mill, Belgium uh, mill, mash conversion vessel, a mash filter. This step here is the, probably the most critical step in the brewing process. So understanding the single farms you need to understand what to do here because every single farm batch that comes into us we have to treat a little bit differently because the grain reacts differently in the brew house from all these single farms and particularly when you get to organic and biodynamic and heritage grains you really really have to concentrate here because you need to set your recipe correct to ensure you break down those starches into sugars and break down the enzymes that you need for fermentation we, get a certain from we would for each farm, so we would request the monster to give us a sort of analysis, so I'd have a fair understanding how it's going to react um, in the brew house. So without that critical information, you would not be able to set your recipe here. So when I talk about recipes, first step is setting your mill gap correctly, that you break up that grain. Like we saw yesterday, we picked up a, um, a heritage variety versus a conventional, and the heritage one was a lot smaller than your conventional. What that means is that if you didn't touch your mill gap setting, you will not break up that grain um, enough to ensure you expose those starches you need. Also, because the grain size was small, it's a lot harder to mill. It's like a pebble. It's really difficult to mill, so you're not going to compound it down into a powder that, that you would have for the bigger conventional barley, so you have to do things differently. So the mill gap is set a little bit. It actually works in reverse. Because the grain is harder, you actually have to set the mill gap out wider. You would think when the, if the grain was smaller that you have to bring in the mill gap. It actually works the opposite. You have to bring it out because it's so difficult to, to break the energy that's, that, 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 that is um, made here while milling goes up. The energy goes up, so you need to make sure the mill gap is out a little bit. Now, I'm only talking about point, point 0.1 of a millimetre tiny tiny mill gap all right but it it's all critical then the second step is making sure your stand temperatures are correct so your the critical one here would be your gelatinization temperature that temperature that's required to break down those starches into sugars if you don't set the right temperature there you are not going to break down the starch into sugars which means you're going to have a poor fermentation and you're going to have a poor yield you're not going to get enough spirit at the end of the process so here 
If you don't get it right, you're not going to get good yield. You're probably not going to extract the flavors you want out from that single farm. And this is where you lose your, this is where you lose everything, this step here. Then once we're happy, we have the right recipe. Then what you're doing here is your, goes through a mash filter. So you're separating that sweet wort you produced here from the grain. So the grain is no longer needed. So you just separate it through a mash filter. Upstairs, we saw a mash, a mash ton. That's the very same thing as this. It's just, you're doing it on a horizontal, a horizontally, right? Some more modern distilleries are starting to use mash filters. They tend to be, they say that the, the people who, who supply them to us would tell us that there's better extract efficiency from mash filters. For me as a brewer, it's choice, whether you prefer to use a mash ton, a louder ton, or a mash filter. They all do the same thing. They all remove the grain from, from your mash. Okay, so it's down to preference. We inherited a mash filter, works perfect for single farm um, model. Um, if you were doing a, a pot still whiskey or a, or a blended whiskey, you, you would need probably a, a louder ton with a cereal cooker because you're doing rice and wheats and other cereals, which wouldn't go through a mash filter. It's perfect for single malt, all right? The draft goes back out to the farm, so we're on organic um, grain now, so that will go back out to the organic farmers. And the wort that we're interested in is cooled to 20 degrees. We pitch our yeast and then we ferment. Now another thing we do different here in Waterford is we actually ferment for minimum 120 hours. So it's minimum five days fermentation. Typically in the industry, you would ferment for maybe two and a half, three days. Produce an alcohol and then distill it. All right, that's all you're interested in is getting alcohol, distilling. So we tend to leave it an extra two days and the purpose of that is we do a secondary fermentation, it's called a malolactic fermentation. It ensures we get the style of spirit that we want here. You're extracting more flavor from the grain by doing this. And you will also add a sort of a more floral, fruity style of spirit when you distill it by doing that longer fermentation. All right, so that's critical to the Waterford style of spirit that we do a five day fermentation. So we'd hope to have eight, nine percent alcohol at the end of fermentation. So from the 100 ton of barley that you saw yesterday in the bay, we would fill four fermentation vessels. So we would do eight brews of nine ton. We would fill four fermentation vessels, so that equates to about 350,000 liters of wash. And now we need to distill that. So I'll hand over to Ian to talk about the pot still. So Neil, Neil was just saying that we finished up with an eight or nine, ten percent. That's your small beer, I suppose. That's what you need to start off with. No. It's, it's, it, we call it a small beer, but there's no hops or anything like that. It's just a basic, a basic beer. So what we do then is we send it up to our wash still. And our wash still, wash still will bring it up to about 20, 28 to 30% ABV. Yep. That's our first run. After that, then we collect that into our low wines and faints, and then we send it into our spirit still. And our spirit still then is the money maker. That's the one that gives, gives us the, 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 the liquid that we want to produce the whiskey at the end of it. So we finish up with a, a finished spirit of about 70 to 72% ABV. Yep. And that's what we cask at then. So Neil just said it takes about five, about a week to brew. It takes about five days again or eight days again after that to distill a full, uh, a full farm. So it's continuously going 24 hours a day for, uh, I think we do, for how, many, how many weeks a year do we, dist do we brew and distill? 48 weeks a 48, year. 48, yeah, yeah. 48 weeks a year because we ha the guys have to have a holiday sometimes during the year. <laughs> so uh, we, g we give them a break. So yeah, so spirits, so your spirit still then leaves off, you collect our spirit receiver here, our 71% spirit here, then it's sent out to our spirit tank. We don't cask, we don't fill cask here on site, it's sent to our where we'll be going out to Ballygarren later on and it's shipped there by tanker out to Ballygarren and everything is cast out there. I suppose it's important to note that we only do a double distillation, not yeah. triple distillation. So a lot of people come here and ask, Irish whiskey, triple distilled, how come you don't triple distill? You don't have to triple distill, it's called Irish whiskey. It was, people believe that Irish whiskey is triple distilled because for over 100 years we only had two distilleries and both of those or distilleries triple. were triple dis distillation. We choose to do a double distillation because it lends better for the style of whiskey or spirit that we want from our single farm model. You do a triple distillation, you tend to strip off those flavours that, that we would want. It, it's more, it, yeah, it, especially with the, with the shape and design of our stills too, our angle of our line arm is, is, not, is very shallow. So that lends to a more robust style of spirit that comes off it as well. 
So that, that with the flavour of that meal is collected on the brewing site, it, it, it gives a better representation of what meal is, what meal is done to collect it on each farm with the way we, on, on a double distillation. And I, I think also from the point of view that Mark came from Bloclady and that was double distilled, so he just wanted to keep that kind of story going on really as well. It's what he, it's what he was used to and what he, was, what he was doing over there. He started the whole Terroir project kind of over there in a little bit before it was bought by Remy and then we just continued the story and just took it on further and further steps. That's it. And, and I think what's important as well is that we, we do a very, very slow distillation. So we ramp everything down. Like it's, for us, it's not about quantity of spirit that we produce. It's about the, quali the quality of it. So by ramping down the spirit stills and putting less energy into it, you're kind of doing a gentle distillation. So you're ensuring that you're getting better spirits and flavors off of the distillation. So what's happening on the spirits that you're getting a reflux effect here. If you were putting a lot of energy into here and boiling it up real vigorously and, and very quickly, you're getting a lot of vapors over here very quickly, minimum amount of copper contact, and you condense it down to a spirit and you're potentially losing flavor, all right? When you're very harsh spirit. Very harsh spirit, very fainty. What happens if you slow down, this, they put less steam on it, less pressure on it, you do a gentle boil, the heavier vapors have more copper contact in this area and the lighter vapors then slowly come up here into your line armor, as Ian said, and the importance of the shape of that then determines the style of spirit you'll get. By slowing everything down, you get a better quality spirit off it and the flavor that's represented from the single farms then and the long fermentation, we will see it in the finished spirit, all right? These spirit stills are designed to run about three or four times faster, faster. than we actually run them. So we actually slow everything because we're not interested in quantities of spirit and yields and all that we're interested in getting the best flavors from the single farms we can so we run it about 400 liters an hour on the spirit still and uh, the other one is about 900 1000 liters an hour yeah. so for for a whole wash still and a spirit still cycle run it takes about 10 and a half hours depending on the on each mm. farm and how, and how much spirit we're getting off them as the the organics and the the biodynamics and heritage, they have a bit of a lower yield coming off them. It's just harder to, it's harder to deal with them, so they, they would have a little less. So each farm would give us about 40,000 litres of alcohol, of conventionally grown barley. Uh, that would come down to about what on? About 20,000 litres, half of that for heritage. If you're on the heritage, so the heritage barley yields half for the farmer, and we would get half again at, at distillations. And it, it, so. it's, 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 it's it's a good comparison to see actually because it's the same tonnage of barley but the yeast that are coming off it is, is half of what you get off a conventionally grown barley. And that's they, they don't have the same starches and the same enzyme breakdowns that they would in, in modern because modern ones have been, modern barley varieties have been designed just for yield and not for yeah. flavour. And that's probably why a lot of distilleries probably aren't using old heritage varieties because it costs a lot to produce yeah. it here and you get an awful lot less spirit here. I suppose so, the thing about the single farm and the single about the single farm brewing and distilling, it's more about it's more about uh, finding, comparing those flavors in the actual soil and the and the microclimate where it's where it's grown more than the actual barley itself. Mm -hmm. It's it's what influence that has given to the actual flavor of the barley, because they're very they've been bred and crossbred so long that they've lost any any uniqueness of what they were originally before that, their, their parentage and their, their, their mother plants and father plants before that. So it's more about where the soil comes and that's what the, I think people don't understand that with the Tower project it's more about where it's from and not the yeah, actual it's barley it's itself. The, yeah, the soil and the microclimate has yeah. a bigger influence over the flavour of the spirit than the barley variety and we've proven that in our academic studies that place and climate has a bigger impact on flavour than your actual barley variety. And we've proven that academically, as Ian said. Yeah. I wonder you always get the same yield. Sorry? I wonder you get always the same yield with the different types. Of we, if, if we were looking at single farms yeah. throughout here, you would get similar yields, but the crop year is actually, depending on how the actual crop year goes, you could get your big variances. So if you had a poor year um, weather-wise, yeah. that influences our yield. Yeah. But you would have slight differences from farm to farm of, of yield, maybe one or two percent, depending oh, on how, where it came from and how it was farmed. Or what barley variety. We, yeah. like, we don't use, we don't, how many barley varieties have we used over the years? 
Oh, they're 11. Fif 15, I think, we're up 15? to now went to Heritage, yeah. Yeah. Like, just, just your question, if we got 40,000 litres from a conventional farm, and we, we'd yield probably, our target would be 95% yield from a conventional farm. For organics, we would get about 35,000 litres, and we would yield about 90%. Mm -hmm. So you'd get 90% yield potential. For the heritage, we would be lucky to get 80% yield from the heritage barley. All right, so very, very difficult to work with. But you would have variances from farm to farm as well, but, but only 1%, 2% either way, plus or minus your target. Yeah. So <coughs> at the end of our process then, we just have our pot ale again, which is another, same as with the drafts, the secondary thing, which goes out to the farm and grow, pig, pig farmers that would take that, just mix it in with their feed. So there's no loss and no, no waste or anything like that. So as I said then, unlike most distilleries again, we, we would have a finished spirit of 71%. Most distilleries would have that, but then they would break it down with water, down to about 63 or 65, and then fill our casks. But we fill straight away at 71%. So what we do is we ship it, we send it from our spirits receiver out to our spirit tank, which is just out in the yard here. It gives us gives us space for a, a lorry to come in with a tanker so we can just fill our spirit. So each farm is set over, each farm is set over to, uh, two tankers out to Ballygarren, which we'll see later on this afternoon, and uh, that's where we fill our casks out there. That was a bit more water, I think. And was there an age plan for different farms? Yeah. No, you're right. So what we did at the start is we standardised it to minimum 120 hours for every farm. Now the critical part of standardised, so yeast doesn't have an influence on flavour, is that we do the very same pitching rate for every single farm, whether it's organic, biodynamic, conventional, is the same pitching, pitching rate of 12 kgs of compressed yeast for every tonne of grain. But what I found once we started using organic and biodynamic, I find at the moment that we may shorten the fermentation by about 5-10 hours on particularly your um, biodynamic and your heritage because you're not producing as much sugar as your conventional so you have to bring that fermentation time down by about five or five to ten hours so if you're getting a lot of sugar from your brewing here if you're getting a lot of sugar from your water if your gravity is up we will standardize that 120 if you don't get your sugars from a particular grain we will shorten the fermentation five or ten hours but we will still be minimum 110 i'd say for the, for them ones Every single farm is a new challenge, no matter where it's from. But um, you have particular attention to the very first brew of every single farm, just to make sure there's no major differences, because you can never overly rely on having the same batch every time. So every new farm that comes in, you do. You have to treat it with a little bit of respect and a little bit of focus. But after one brew, you get an idea. Like when I was a brewer for Guinness, you brought in a batch of barley and it was generic for about six months. A variety of barley would come in, or malt, and you would get your sort of analysis, and you would know you were going to be on that for the next six months because your procurement team have bought enough barley to do the brewery six months. So you set your mash bill off the first batch, and it stays like that for, until you get, get onto another variety of barley. But what happens here is every single farm I have to treat differently. The problem is... Ne not yet. I've never had a batch to say I couldn't use it. I couldn't work with it. The most difficult batches are the heritage batches. And the problem we have, because I have only a short window of a week, by the time I brew one single batch, it still hasn't fermented fully. And we still even haven't distilled it. So... I finished brewing, but we still haven't processed it through the distillery, so I still don't know how its fermentation is going, and I still don't know what yield we're going to get off it. So basically, the horse is bolted by the time I can react to anything. So basically, all I try and do is get the set points right here, get the gravities up as high as I can, and hopefully it ferments well and distills well. If it's a poor yield at the end of it, there's nothing I can do. I'm already on the next farm. So there's very, very little I can do. It's basically for me, it's just getting it through the brewing, 
getting the best gravities I can possibly get out of it to give it the best chance for fermentation and distilling. Like the barley report he, that he gets off bench is critical for how he can adjust his mash bills. Mm. Like if, 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 that's, if that's not right there, he, he'll actually find out anyway at the end of fermentation if the, if the information he was after getting here from the maltings was wrong. Mm. Because if they wouldn't, he wouldn't be getting the same yeah, yield coming at, off it. Yeah, and look, and the sort of analysis is basically nearly always right. The, 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 the lab they send analysis for is a highly reputable lab and it's, it's fairly consistent. But because it's a five day fermentation, brewing is finished by the time the first fermentation is complete. So it's very hard to get it, to get it up. No, it is not going well. This, this year's, this year's, or last year's crop of biodynamic is working, is, is a lot, I suppose, we're not getting as much yield or potential out of it we, than we did from crop 21. And it's hunter variety. It's hunter variety grown in the same farms. The only difference is it's a different crop year. And I started off the recipe the very same as the year before, but we're not getting the same results. So for me, it's completely down to the different growing conditions from 2021 versus 2022. Everything else is still the same. Last year was a very quick growing year though. Yeah. We had very good weather in this country. I don't know what... Uh, they, um, they harvested very early. Very early, yeah. So uh, like it, it was after ripening up very, very quickly last year. I think we were actually harvesting middle of July last year and it's usually like the first or second week of August. It was just a very good summer in Ireland. Yeah. Well, you can call it that, but they did have their problems with it too. Like, it, like they were trying to control moisture and stuff like that for the last end, for the end of the growing cycle. But it was a very good year for the farmers. The, the barley yielded yields well, the yields yeah. were well up. The proteins were down, but we're not seeing that. No, I'm not seeing it. Now, this is the first batch of 2022 crop I'm dealing with, and it's biodynamic. So really, I can't make a comment on that until I get onto the conventional growers. 2022 batch because that's that will give us a better understanding how the crop year is biodynamic organic heritage are going to be difficult to work with anyway so we have a couple of months of that now have we yeah three three months three months of that now before we reach conventions all right um, yeah. you done with casks yeah we're done with it well, well i suppose out to ballygarren then we'll see that it's, it's better to see that in the actual flesh when you go out there and see it basically it's all our casky is done out there, our marrying tanks are out there for when we're producing our whiskies, and Ned will bring you through that one in the lab later on as well. But I suppose we'll just go for a little walk around now and just see the actual equipment upstairs. It's nice to see it and look at some uh, infographs.